Hello and welcome to The Conversation Weekly. This week, as abortion rights head back to the US Supreme Court, we hear about what's at stake and take a look at other recent changes to abortion laws around the world. The problem is that whenever we have progress, we always have a backlash. Once women have access to safe, clandestine abortion with pills, they won't go back. And I talk with a forensic scientist who's been studying bones to try and find a way to identify long lost evidence of death by lightning strike. At the cellular level, where the the individual bone cells are, there were cracks running out from the center of the cells. I'm Dan Reno in San Francisco. And I'm Gemma Ware, this week in Paris. You're listening to The Conversation Weekly, the world explained by experts. One of the most contentious issues in American politics is back before the U.S. Supreme Court talking, of course, about abortion. The U.S. Supreme Court agreed to hear a case that could end up curbing abortion rights. The Supreme Court has been considering whether to allow a legal challenge to a law in Texas that was introduced just September. Senate Bill 8 effectively banned abortion after around six weeks of pregnancy, or when cardiac activity can be detected in a fetus. That's before many women know that they're pregnant. But the Texas law works in a bit of an unusual way. It empowers citizens to enforce the ban themselves by suing abortion providers. The Texas law isn't the only abortion case that the Supreme Court will be considering this session. On the 1st of December, it will also begin hearing oral arguments in another case, this time regarding a law in Mississippi. The Mississippi state legislature passed the law in 2018, and this bans most abortion after around 15 weeks of pregnancy. It's never been implemented because of ongoing legal challenges, which have now made it to the Supreme Court. Taken together, these two laws are a broad challenge to existing abortion rights in the U.S. I spoke to an expert to help explain. There are a lot of laws like this. These are just the two that have made it through the federal court system and are going to be decided before the court, um, with implications for all the other 1,400 or so laws that have also restricted abortion since 1973. This is Amanda Jean Stevenson, an assistant professor of sociology at the University of Colorado Boulder in the U.S. I'm a demographer and sociologist. I study the impacts of and social responses to family planning policy in the contemporary United States. So this includes abortion policy and contraception policy and, you know, how people end up having babies or not having babies. The legal questions before the Supreme Court, in particular surrounding the Texas case, are complicated and nuanced. But underlying both the Mississippi and Texas challenges is the status of Roe v. Wade, a landmark Supreme Court ruling from 1973. Here's a quick background from Amanda. In the United States, in the middle of the last century, abortion was illegal in most places. And during that time, people still accessed abortion and sought abortion care, but the abortions that they got were quite dangerous. There was widespread maternal morbidity and mortality associated with abortion in the United States, and there was a broad base of support to legalize abortion in order to save people's lives. And there was also feminist support to make abortion legal on the basis of autonomy. But The argument that won out in the U.S. federal court system focused more on the rights of physicians to provide care. Um, And so the decision that ultimately made abortion legal in all 50 U.S. states was Roe v. Wade in 1973. Abortion became legal in the entire U.S. A woman in Texas going under the pseudonym Jane Roe sued her local district attorney, Henry Wade, over the state's restrictive abortion laws. The case went all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, which upheld her challenge. It prohibited states from restricting abortion before certain gestational ages. So after about the first trimester, states could start implementing restrictions, but they couldn't ban the procedure. And then they could ban the procedure at fetal viability. That's when the fetus can survive outside of the pregnant person's body. Um, This has been the law of the land in the United States for about 50 years. But the federal system in the U.S. means that each state can introduce its own laws. And that's what some of them have been doing. In the past year, U.S. states have implemented a record number of abortion restrictions. States really want to restrict access to this procedure. Certain states do. um, States that are dominated by conservative political parties. So uh, this is the context in which these laws are going before the Supreme Court. The question is whether the current justices on the U.S. Supreme Court, which now has a conservative majority, will reaffirm that right to an abortion that was set down in Roe v. Wade, or whether they'll overturn it. 
if Roe v. Wade falls, then that just reverts back to the pre-Roe standard in which states could make their own laws about abortion restrictions without limits from the federal government. That situation would lead to some states leaving abortion legal in some sense, um, and other states making abortion completely illegal. We have good projections about which states that'll be because many states have sort of laws that are triggered when Roe falls. Regardless of the legal patchwork of abortion rights across individual U.S. states, getting an abortion is really difficult and expensive for most people. Like all healthcare in the U.S., abortion is something that people have to pay for or use private insurance usually to access. And abortion is usually not covered by insurance, whether public or private. And so because of this, most people who get abortions pay for them out of pocket on their own. So that creates a case where rich people can get abortions and and poorer people can't? Well, yeah. So rich people can get abortions more easily and poorer people have to make big sacrifices to get abortions. So most people who get abortions report having to sell things, borrow money, pawn important objects and so forth to cobble together the money to be able to afford the procedure. We have a robust network of NGOs that Uh, try to collect money to support people getting abortions. They're called abortion funds. Um, But they cannot come anywhere near to meeting the needs of everyone who needs support. On top of all this, in the summer of 2019, a number of states started debating and passing a wave of new laws restricting access to abortion. A shouting match erupted in the Alabama State Senate yesterday over the details of a controversial yes, abortion bill. The battle over Missouri's Virginia Governor Ralph Northam is facing backlash for supporting a state measure that would loosen restrictions on late-term abortions. These were laws that would make abortion completely illegal, even in cases of rape and incest, which are typically excluded from abortion bans um, in the United States, or limit abortion at six weeks. Amanda was approached by a couple of journalists at the time who asked her, what impact is this going to have? And that's such a broad question, it's hard to answer. But what I knew for sure was that when you force people to stay pregnant, then they're exposed to the mortality risk of staying pregnant. That's way higher than the mortality risk of having an abortion. So my answer to that question right immediately was, well, more people will die because staying pregnant is more dangerous than having an abortion. Death is just one of many consequences of denying abortion to those who need it. And it's actually probably the rarest one. We have really excellent evidence demonstrating that being denied a wanted abortion is associated with worse outcomes ranging from psychological well-being, the well-being of one's existing children, economic outcomes like you know bankruptcy, things like that, and physical health. Being denied a wanted abortion makes your life worse, not just makes you more likely to die. But it does also make you more likely to die. In The most recent years, the mortality ratio is 0.44 per 100,000 pregnancies ending in abortion. And the mortality ratio for just pregnancies in general is something between 13 and 15 per 100,000 births. Using this data, Amanda was able to estimate the number of additional deaths that would be caused by a nationwide ban on all abortions. And she recently published her findings in a new study. In the study that I did, because it's just a simulation, I said what would happen if all abortion ended in the United States, which would require an action above and beyond Roe v. Wade being overturned. I found that the number of pregnancy-related deaths would increase by 21% overall. The number of additional people who would die from pregnancy-related causes after the first year of a ban, so in the second and subsequent years, would be 140. So an additional 140 pregnancy-related deaths would occur each year if abortion went away. She also looked at whether an outright ban on abortion would impact some racial and ethnic groups more than others. I found that there would be an increase in pregnancy-related deaths in all race-ethnic categories, um, but the increase would be dramatically larger for non-Hispanic Black people Um, 33% increase for that population. So this is a really big deal because we have a crisis in Black maternal health in the United States. Um, Maternal mortality ratios and pregnancy-related mortality ratios for this population are three to four or even five times higher than they are for the more advantaged populations who aren't subject to racism. And this disparity in death, most pregnancy-related deaths are preventable, is an enduring tragedy. I mean, it is it is a crisis that just keeps happening. She says this was an incredibly sad simulation to do. When I estimated these numbers, I literally broke down crying. 
So what could prevent these deaths from happening, do you think? If we made it easier for people to travel to get abortions or made it easier for people to access um, medication abortions at home, which is something that a lot of people are working on in the US and in other countries, then people wouldn't be subject to the increased risk of staying pregnant or we could just not have banned abortion. Roe v. Wade was always, at least to me, the central reference point when it comes to abortion. It was the only thing that was ever really discussed, at least here in the United States. You know, I wanted to find that out too, Dan. And what I discovered was that the US is kind of an exception. To find out more, I called up two academics to help provide a better global understanding of what's going on. The overall trend globally is towards more progressive laws on abortion and rollback of abortion rights and movement towards more restrictive abortion laws is actually an outlier globally. This is Sydney Culkin, a senior lecturer in geography at Queen Mary University of London in England. My work looks at the way that abortion access is changing around the world. Sydney says that only a handful of countries have actually moved to implement more restrictive abortion laws in recent years. Among them, of course, the US, Poland and Nicaragua. El Salvador, which bans abortion in all circumstances, also recently began incarcerating women for miscarriages and suspected abortions. But these countries are in the minority. Globally, we're seeing a general move towards more progressive abortion laws. And countries move at different paces along that trajectory. But generally, the trend is actually uh, positive. In Latin America recently, we've seen huge wins for abortion rights in Argentina, in Chile, in Mexico. In Europe, we've seen really enormous and really positive changes in Ireland and Northern Ireland, for instance. Ireland overturned its abortion ban in a referendum in 2018. Today, we as a people have spoken and we say that we trust women to make their own decisions and their own choices. In Northern Ireland, the situation is a bit more complicated. But in 2019, the UK government in Westminster made abortion legal in cases of fetal abnormalities in Northern Ireland. Still, there are ongoing legal challenges and it remains hard to access abortion services in Northern Ireland. Meanwhile, in Africa, where many countries only allow abortion in limited circumstances, some laws are also changing. In late October, for example, Benin's parliament voted to legalise abortion. A significant ruling for the women of Benin, as the country's lawmakers late on Wednesday voted to legalise abortion within the first 12 weeks of pregnancy. Despite this global trend towards more permissive abortion laws, it remains incredibly difficult to get an abortion in many parts of the world. Malta remains the only EU country with a total ban on abortion. And a bill trying to decriminalise the procedure was blocked in the country's parliament earlier this year. Elsewhere, for example in China, the situation remains uncertain. In September, a state policy document indicated that it would become harder for women to access non-medical abortions. China is trying to boost its falling population numbers after decades of a strict one-child policy, and many analysts suggest this might be the reason for restricting abortion. But still, those handful of countries that are actively introducing laws to make abortions harder are the outliers. So why is this happening? I'm not sure that we could really identify a kind of single cause beyond religious fundamentalism. Like the rollbacks that are happening in the US and Poland, for instance, have a lot to do with very specific political and institutional dynamics in those countries. What's happening in Poland is very, very related to Polish political and social and religious dynamics. So what is happening in Poland? As part of her research, Sydney has closely followed the situation in Poland and talked to pro-choice activists there. She explained what's been happening in more detail. But first, a bit of history. During the bulk of the 20th century, Poland was a kind of satellite state of the Soviet Union. It was a, a socialist state. And between 1956 and 1993, Poland had legal and free abortion as part of a socialist health care system. By the late 1980s, the tides had turned against communist rule in Europe and Poland broke away from the Soviet Union. And the abortion law that's currently in force in Poland actually only came in in 1993. So this restrictive abortion law was one of the first laws that was passed um, after the fall of the state socialist regime in Poland and after the transition to democracy in Poland. This has 
a lot to do with the institutional power of the Catholic Church during that time in Poland. The 1993 law banned all abortions, with three exceptions. And those exceptions were abortion was permitted where there was a threat to uh, the life of the pregnant woman, where the pregnancy was the result of a crime, so, for instance, rape, and where there was a serious anomaly with the fetus. But even getting an abortion under these exceptions was really difficult. There are a lot of Polish um, lawyers and NGOs that have done work to show that even where women met the legal grounds for abortion in Poland, they were unable to find doctors who would provide the abortions um, because anti-abortion stigma there is so, so, so dramatic. And because a lot of medical institutions and doctors consider themselves to be conscientious objectors to the law. So even where maybe someone qualified under the grounds of having a a fetal anomaly, they could not access legal abortion in Poland and ended up traveling abroad. And the sort of de facto situation for most people in Poland was that abortion was just fully inaccessible. Just to give you a sense of the numbers, in the last few years, in a a country of about 38 million people, there were about 1,000 legal abortions granted every year. So the the rate is exceptionally low. Of these 1,000 or so abortions that did take place, Sydney says around 97 or 98 percent of them were on the basis of serious fetal anomaly. That means there was a diagnosis of a serious problem with the fetus that would mean it was very likely to miscarry, be stillborn or die very soon after birth. That was essentially the only grounds to have an abortion at all in Poland. But then last year, Poland's constitutional court made a new ruling. They ruled that the grounds for allowing abortion when there was a serious fetal anomaly was unconstitutional. This ruling was met with huge protests across Poland. Poland is seeing its biggest protests in decades with widespread fury at a decision to almost totally ban abortion. The chilling effect of the change to the law was seen as soon as it was announced. There were widespread reports of scheduled abortions being cancelled, doctors refusing to treat patients who did actually qualify. Sydney stresses that this doesn't mean it was impossible for people to access abortion. Part of her own research focuses on abortion pills, medication that can be taken at home in the early stages of pregnancy. This isn't illegal in Poland, but it's a question of access. There's a network called Abortion Without Borders who help people in Poland to access abortion, whether that's um, self-managed abortion with pills at home or whether that is um, an abortion where they need to travel outside of Poland. Abortion pills can only be used to self-manage an abortion safely up until about 12 weeks. So there's still plenty of people who have to travel abroad. They travel to Germany, to the Netherlands, to England, to Spain. Then earlier this month, news emerged that a woman had died in September because she'd been refused an abortion. She was miscarrying and doctors refused to treat her to complete the miscarriage because they said that they detected a fetal heartbeat. So this woman died while she was in the hospital being monitored by doctors, and she died of sepsis, an infection um, associated with an incomplete abortion. It's an utter tragedy. Big protests have taken place in Poland again in recent weeks about the case, which is subject to an ongoing investigation. Thousands of women took to the streets of Polish capital of Warsaw after a pregnant woman's death reignited public debate on the issue. In defense of its legal regime, the government has said, oh, these doctors were not abiding by the law. These doctors could have terminated the pregnancy and been within the law. Because it would have saved her life. Yes. So that's what the government is saying. Um, But that does seem to be a bit of a face-saving mechanism. There's a staunchly anti-abortion nationalist populist government in Poland. It's clear that they've created a culture and a a climate of anti-abortion stigma and that that does have a chilling effect on doctors. Maybe the death of this woman in Poland might cause a bit of a wake-up call on the part of the Polish population um, because it is so utterly tragic and preventable. Okay, so we focused on Poland and earlier on the US. But as Sydney told me, these two countries are some of the outliers. Globally, more countries are actually lifting abortion restrictions under law than imposing them. And one of the regions at the forefront of this is Latin America. 
It really does depend on the way that the wind is blowing politically. But I would say in Latin America, we've definitely seen concrete signs of progress. This is Jane Marcus Delgado. She's a professor of political science at the College of Staten Island, part of City University of New York. Most recently, I wrote a book called The Politics of Abortion in Latin America. I mostly look at global politics and interactions and um, transnational movements that affect abortion rights policies in Latin America. Her research focuses on the politics of reproductive rights in Latin America. Jane explained a bit about the history of abortion rights in the region. Latin America, historically, through most of the 20th century, was not that concerned with abortion rights. But just like in Poland, Jane says the Catholic Church and other conservative groups continued to have a strong influence across the region, and this fed into anti-abortion debates. And I think it was really around the time when things began to heat up internationally in women's movements in the 1960s and into the 1970s with the legalization of abortion in in parts of Europe and also in the United States, that things really began to face a backlash in Latin America. And at that point in those decades, the 70s, the 80s, there began to be crackdowns on abortion rights and kind of a rise of a reaction against the legalization and decriminalization of abortion in Latin America. A number of countries that had previously allowed abortion began to criminalize it. The restrictions ranged by country, with some continuing to allow abortion in cases of rape or incest or fetal inviability. That ranged to complete bans of abortion in all circumstances, and that happened in countries like uh, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Chile, Haiti, Honduras also. So what's happened since then is this uh, give and take where uh, rights have been taken away in some instances they've eased up, in some instances there has been legalization. But there's been a real sort of push and pull. Every time something is liberalized just a little bit, there's a backlash and then there's some kind of a crackdown. So right now, that's what we're in the middle of. Um, Certain progress in some areas and then setbacks in other areas. In the past couple of years, pro-choice activists have won some big legal victories in the region. In December 2020, Argentina's Congress legalised abortions up until the 14th week of pregnancy. And Argentina just fought for years and years, and they have super strong feminist movements in Argentina, and it's very, very active. And yet they pushed and pushed and pushed for abortion rights legislation and finally passed it last year to legalise abortion in most cases. Then, just a couple of months ago in September, the law changed in Mexico. Mexico's Supreme Court has ruled that imposing penalties for abortion is unconstitutional. The Supreme Court in Mexico passed a unanimous ruling that declared that punishment of abortion was unconstitutional. And that's really kind of amazing because Mexico is a federal system. Mexico is more like the United States in the sense that individual states pass different kinds of legislation. Mexico City has had legalized abortion for quite a few years, and then other of the surrounding states had had criminalized it. But now their Supreme Court at the national level has ruled that punishing of abortion is unconstitutional. Jane says it's still a bit unclear about how the ruling in Mexico will play out, particularly in states with more conservative administrations. There's an expectation of more legal challenges to come particularly in those states which have a provision in their state-level constitution that life begins at conception. And that life beginning at conception provision that's found in constitutions in many, many, many parts of Latin America is what is going to be the biggest challenge, because I'm not quite sure how that squares with the national distinction that it's unconstitutional. And then there's Chile. Back in 2017, its parliament overturned an outright abortion ban, legalising it in three exceptional circumstances. When a fetus is inviolable, when a woman's life is in danger or as victims of uh, incest or rape. But in September, the lower houses of parliament voted to begin debating a bill that would decriminalise abortion up to 14 weeks. A similar move is happening in Colombia, where abortion has been allowed in limited circumstances since 2006. Now the issue is back before the country's constitutional court again after a challenge by pro-choice activists that could see the decriminalisation of abortion in Colombia altogether. So I asked Jane, what's led to this wave of decriminalisation of abortion across Latin America? 
I think that everybody who works in this topic agrees that the main thing that influences uh, abortion rights legislation has to do with the power of a women's movement or the a feminist movement, a reproductive rights movement. Um, and that's always vis-a-vis other forces that have influence in, in a society. She says this is what happened in Mexico, where there was a huge organized coalition of movements working together to change the law. The other thing that I think was a, a tremendous catalyst in the case of Mexico was a national uproar about gender-based violence and violence against women and girls. So I think that the outrage that people feel about this kind of violence also helps to lift up support for abortion rights. And I think that the cases that are particularly heinous always trigger public opinion. There's been cases in Brazil and cases in in different parts of the world of girls who were victims of incest or rape and 11-year-old, 12-year-olds being forced to carry pregnancies to term, even when it could jeopardize their own life or at least have a terrible, terrible effect on their future. Um, And so those kinds of cases, it's pretty hard to argue against abortion rights. She thinks what's happened in Mexico and Argentina sends a powerful signal to the rest of the region. What they do on the plus side is they really, really invigorate and energize non-governmental organizations, grassroots movements, and um, people in public opinion and also in positions in government. The problem is that there's also a tremendous rise of anti-choice, conservative people, both at the grassroots level and also in government all over Latin America. So whenever we have progress, we always have a backlash. She points to Brazil, where abortion is legal in only very limited circumstances. The biggest backlash that sort of counterbalances this is the influence of uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil, who is sort of radically anti-choice. And there's a huge block of super anti-abortion legislators in the lower house and Congress in, in Brazil. Jane's argument is that the liberalization of abortion rights in Latin America is not a one-way street. And even in those countries where it's now legal to terminate an unwanted pregnancy, there are still many barriers to accessing abortion services and many battles ahead for pro-choice activists. For Sydney Culkin, in countries with restrictive abortion laws, the availability of abortion pills, which can be bought online, can be a game changer. It's something she's been looking at a lot in her own research. The thing that I'm most interested in is the question of whether or not widespread access to clandestine abortion with pills actually makes restrictive laws unenforceable. Abortion pills are not available or suitable for everybody who wants to terminate a pregnancy. And Sydney acknowledges that. People who want to self-manage abortion with pills can do so safely in a self-managed context during the first trimester. But people with wanted pregnancies who get a diagnosis of a serious fetal anomaly, that diagnosis usually comes much later at which point it's too late to self-manage an abortion with pills. So it is important to say that the kind of optimism around the potential of pills to transform abortion access, that is limited. And that can never be a substitute for free, safe, legal and local abortion care by medical providers. But Sydney points to what happened in Ireland in the decade before the referendum which legalised abortion as an example of how the landscape is changing. We saw dramatic changes in the way that people were accessing abortion. You know, we saw fewer people traveling to England to access abortion and more people actually ordering pills to have a self-managed safe abortion at home. And this had a big impact on the political and the legal process there. One doctor who was really a public face in the referendum campaign who was supportive of abortion rights He explained it to the politicians like this. He said, when it comes to abortion with pills, the genie is out of the bottle. And by that, he meant once women have access to safe, clandestine abortion with pills, they won't go back. So those kind of trends are visible globally. If you want to read more about abortion access around the world, we'll pop some links to recent stories on the conversation in our show notes. And stay tuned to the site in the coming months as scholars keep an eye on the legal arguments in those two US Supreme Court cases. Now for our next story on something quite different. 
This is about some new research on lightning strikes and the traces they leave behind on bones, in particular, human bones. I called up one of the authors on that new study, Patrick Randolph Quinney, an associate professor of forensic science at Northumbria University in England. My name is Pat Randolph Quinney. I'm an associate professor of forensic science at Northumbria University in the northeast of England. I am a forensic anthropologist, but ostensibly I deal with dead people, whether that's from body recovery or analyzing their remains to give them back an identity, that type of thing. Um, and forensic trauma, so understanding what happens to people around the time of their death and after death has been one of the, the areas that I focused a lot on over the last couple of decades. All right. So for your recent research, you were actually looking at lightning. You'd think it would be a pretty easy thing to identify, you know, hair sticking up, etc. It seems like that has not historically been the case. So can you explain what the holes were in the understanding from a forensic scientific perspective? So I was working at Witz University, so the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. And um, anybody who's ever spent any time in, in uh, the high fells around Johannesburg, Pretoria in the summer will know you get these incredible lightning storms. It's very high altitude and you get these massive storms in November, December through to about February time. And they can last, in some cases, hours. Um, and we, we came into possession of some bones of a wild giraffe that had been hit by lightning. And you know, other types of trauma, so if I'm looking at things like gunshot wounds or blunt force trauma or stabbings um, or when a body's burnt, they the very particular traces in the skeleton that we can interpret. When it comes to lightning, um, most of what we know from lightning is the effects that it actually has on the soft tissues of the body, on the, the lungs, the cardiovascular system, uh, on the skin. And if bodies turn up on the bush from South Africa, they're very often skeletonized or they're mummified, and you don't have those soft tissue markers. So we, we just asked, it was just a basic question is, I wonder what happens to the skeleton. Does it leave a recognizable trace? And that was the whole start of the research. How common are lightning strikes in general? Do we have any estimate of how many people get struck by lightning yearly and how many people die? The figures are patchy. It's reckoned close to about 25,000 people a year are injured or, or killed as part of lightning strikes. It's about 250 in South Africa alone. And depends where you are. They're very un uncommon in the high latitudes, but they're very they're common close to the equator. Southern Africa has big issues, Uganda, Central and West Africa, but also in the Americas and Southeast Asia as well. Uh, less so in Europe and less so in the United States. But the severity and incidence of, of lightning storms is increasing with climate change. Are there any differences in the ways lightning can strike a person? So you've got five different types of ways that lightning actually causes injury to people. So you've got what's called direct strike. That's where it directly contacts the body, so it attaches to the body. It's, it's thought that about 3 to 5% of fatalities in, in developed countries anyway are caused by this. Most of your other types of strikes are what's called, called contact voltage, where somebody's touching something that gets hit by lightning. So, you know, you're turning a tap on and, and the, the house is hit by lightning. So that passes through conductive objects into the person and causes damage. And then you've kind of got what's called side-side flash which is when it basically jumps from an object to a person. So if you're sitting underneath a tree and lightning hits the tree, that's the type of effect you'll get. And then you've got what are called ground currents, where lightning hits the ground and affects an area. And that's probably the most common type of lightning death. So it's not hitting the body directly, but the energy is passing through from foot to foot, um, or if individuals lying down or sitting. So, it, and that's the most common type. And, and then you've got something which is a bit a lot rarer, which is something called an upward stream or an upward leader. Very often, what you'll see is it actually starts at ground level and then moves up towards the clouds. And if a person's in the way of that, that can cause damage to them as well. So you've got five different types. Um, depending which type hits you, will cause different patterns of damage. It's either effectively the electrical energy itself, and that causes cardiac arrest, it causes bursting of the eardrums, it causes, you know, in people that survive, it causes neurovascular or neurological problems, it causes what we call Lichtenberg figures in the skin. But it also people also get hit by lightning in what they call non-electrical injury. Um, they can hit by things. So they can get hit by shrapnel. They can get thrown by the blast of the lightning, in which case it's blunt force injuries. And then they have this thing called barotrauma, which is basically a little bit like explosive trauma. That the power of the of the energy 
drives through the body and causes a series of shock waves. So that's basically those are the, the different types of trauma that clinicians would recognize in people hit by lightning or, or affected by lightning um, and, and say no idea about what happened to the skeleton. That was the unknown area. So what did you guys do? Let's get into your research. Yeah, so it started out with that giraffe that we were given. What we did with that was initially was we make a series of very thin slices through the bone. And we can look at those under a microscope. And what we saw was that at the kind of cellular level where the, the individual bone cells are, that they were split apart. They were fractured. There were cracks running out from the center of the cells. And that didn't look normal. Um, you don't expect to see that, and particularly when the rest of the bone is actually in an intact state. So what did you do next? So we started off with a pig-based experiment. So we got hold of some pig bones and we placed them inside an impulse generator and it basically exposed them to, it's actually it's a proportion of the total lightning effect if you were hit by lightning. So it's not even the full amount, but we exposed them to this high impulse current. Then we cut the bone, sliced it up very, very thinly, looked under a microscope, and it produced the same type of fracturing pattern that we saw in the um, giraffe that we know was, was hit by lightning. The fractures were starting out in the center of these cells and then radiating out um, and migrating out and basically breaking the, the bone up into um, kind of segments. So you know, not the kind of thing you would expect to see uh, normally. So it almost looks like as if there was some sort of pressure internally that was cracking yeah. as it expanded. Yeah, yeah, it's a very good analogy. And then obviously the next stage was then to to understand that from the point of view of the human body. So how exactly did you test the effects of lightning on human bones? So I'm working at that time in a department of anatomy, as are Nick and my colleague Tanya Augustine, who was also involved in this from a kind of anatomical side. So both Tanya and myself would spend a lot of our week in the dissection hall at, at Wits. And when people donate their bodies to the medical school or uh, for medical science, we are permitted as part of that donation process to conduct research as well. Um, so we took a series of biopsy samples of the lower limbs, because that's where the thickest bone tends to be in the femur and the tibia. And then we basically built this lightning generator in our anthropology lab um, at BITS. And it's not like I'm young Frankenstein. I was going to say, when you say you built it in your lab, I was picturing like, oh, this thing must be massive. And it's got to yeah. be like one of those Tesla coils, lightning arcing everywhere. Is that not yeah, what it looks no, like? No, that's not what it looks like. It's, it's, it's really is. It's a little bit of a disappointment, I have to admit. So instead, what you've got is everything fits on a, a large workbench. Everything's insulated. And you have a series of connecting plates that... Um, linked then to this impulse generator. And so what we do is we place the bone between uh, an anode and a cathode. So basically we can transmit the, the, the current directly through it. And then you crank the voltage up and the ampage up and off it goes. And you get this flash of light. Sometimes you get this enormous oral shockwave, bang that goes off. So we, we very rapidly realized that we would have to do a lot of these experiments when other people aren't in the lab and when people aren't trying to you know, conduct teaching in surrounding rooms sure, and that type sure, of thing. Sure, 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 sure. Um, and then just repeated the process. So in, in terms of um, we varied the, the current, we varied you know, the energy that's going into the bone um, to see if there were any major differences. And as the energy increases you see more and more fractures taking place. We did the thin section work. And then when we looked at the thin sections, we were back to the same pattern um, that you found on the pigs and the giraffe. What do you actually think was happening in these bones that causes these such signature looking micro fractures? I think we've got two fairly good preliminary models of how this uh, effect is arising. The first one's something called barrow trauma, which is basically it's a pressure wave. Um, you see this in explosive trauma. You see it in lightning strikes in soft tissue. And it's basically the, the buildup of pressure inside the bone itself is splitting them apart as a shock wave moves through the bones. That is a possibility. Um, and we've got to counterbalance it with an inbuilt property that bone has. Bone itself, if you actually look at it as a tissue, is, is a really complex thing. It's made up of a mineral component, which is what we call bioappetite which is a form of quite brittle crystals that are, that are packed in a certain way. And that's what gives bone its rigidity. So it makes it solid. And that's kind of counterbalanced by its organic component, which is called collagen. And that's like a shock absorber. And that shock absorber is integrated in and around the crystals of bioappetite. And when you place bone in an electrical field, the, the collagen, the fibrils or fibers of collagen, actually realign themselves. They move in relation to the field. 
and that causes them to pull on the the bioappetite so it causes stress and that stress then converts into something called strain and the bone breaks so we think it's a combination of those two that you've got this massive electrical field that's going through the body very rapidly and it's pulsing very often and then you've also got this kind of shockwave trauma that's 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 taking place as well the trick now is really to try and model that in in kind of four dimensional way to actually understand how that's going from one end of the bone to the other or one side of the body to the other sure 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 all right pat well it's been my absolute pleasure and uh will please keep us informed on any future research coming out thanks for having me on You can read an article Patrick wrote about his research with some pretty cool close-up images of the bones he did experiments on on the Conversation website. We'll pop a link in the show notes. To end this week's episode, we've got some recommended reading from Wale Fatade, commissioning editor for The Conversation in Lagos, Nigeria. Hello, my name is Wale Fatade. I'm a commissioning editor for The Conversation, based here in Lagos, Nigeria. My first story recommendation is titled African marine rules favor big industry, leaving small-scale fishers in the lodge. Small-scale fisheries contribute more to the African continent's economy than their industrial counterparts. And they are also vital to the livelihoods and diets of millions of people. But sometimes they are up against unfair competition. If a Sinachi or Carrefour Yarwood, a lecturer at the University of St. Andrews, Scotland, and Eddie Alisi, Director of Science and Research, World Fish, at the CGIAR system organization, reviewed fishery governance in Ghana, Liberia, Madagascar, and Somalia, and they found out that governance in these countries favors industrial fisheries, including fleets from distant waters, and heavily constrains small scale fishers. My second story recommendation is on a formula for a tasty and nutritious Nigerian soup with tamales by Adedayo Adeboye a food science lecturer at the Ocean State University here in Nigeria. For someone like me who grew up eating termites, it's interesting that a food scientist is able to show how when termites grinded into powder can be used to enhance Nigerian soup and it turned out to be a very highly nutritious meal by adding protein-rich powder. Thank you and goodbye. That was Wale Fatare there in Lagos. That's it for this week. Thank you to all the academics who've spoken to us for this episode. And thanks to the conversation editors, Megan Clement, Avery Annapol, Laura Hood, Vivian Lamb, Natasha Joseph, and Stephen Kahn. And to Alice Mason for our social media promotion. Find us on Twitter at TC underscore audio, Instagram at theconversation.com, or email us podcast at theconversation.com. And don't forget to sign up for our daily newsletter. Just click the link in the show notes. If you're enjoying The Conversation Weekly, please do leave a rating or review wherever podcast apps allow you to. And just do it old school. Tell your friends and family about the show too. The Conversation Weekly is co-produced by Mend Marawani and me, Gemma Ware, with sound design by Eloise Stevens. Our theme music is by Nita Sal. I'm Dan Marino. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening.